that all right? So, um, what, uh, what an amazing evening. And uh, this is a real celebration. Let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Mike Hardy. I'm the director of the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations at Coventry. I'm Marissa's boss, so every now and then I can be quite forceful and paternalistic. But there's nothing more special than this evening, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And I know that's a feeling that many of you had as well. And I wanted just to say a few words of pure, unadulterated celebration for an amazing journey and uh, an incredible destination. The journey that started almost seven years ago when I first met Marissa. Marissa applied for a, a research fellowship at, uh, at our centre at Coventry. The Coventry Centre had just opened, so it was high risk for us, really attracted by this young scholar, and it was high risk for Marissa, with all that talent, to devote it and invest it in a new centre at Coventry. Coventry Centre at that stage in 2013, 14, was about 12 people with a really powerful aspiration to make a contribution to scholarship, to the development of evidence that could help policy, that could build more peacefulness in a troubled world. And we looked far and wide for scholars. We, we currently have 21 different nationalities. We can operate in 18 different languages. So we looked at, to, for an eclectic and diverse group of scholars who would build a center that would make a contribution and add value to the amazing work that goes on at many of the others, at Queen's here, at Bradford, at King's College, and the many other centers of scholarship in the UK and in broader Europe that are working in this area. The theme we built at Coventry has been a commitment to peacefulness, to understanding those conditions which promote peacefulness. To get peacefulness, you also need peace. You also need to remove the conflict and the violence of, in relationship. But we wanted to focus distinctively on the ability to observe and to learn from places both in conflict, both after conflict, and those places which were peaceful all the time. There's plenty to learn from there. So imagine my joy at finding a young scholar, fresh from her PhD, passionate about wanting to understand the context in which she'd grown up and her family had grown up, the huge sponsorship she had from her family and support in her development of her scholarship and her qualities. And with others, came up with a concept which we thought was ambitious, was aspirational, was high risk, but was really important. And I'm very pleased that we supported the development of that project and working with others in collaboration, as most research projects only happen because of collaborations. And my goodness, we have collaborators here that I'm sure Marissa will refer to and thank. Marissa has been a lone sole trader by the end of her project, but she's never been alone. She's never been working without the support and the reinforcement and the encouragement and the camaraderie that is all around in this city and beyond. And in the peacefulness that we now have in this city and beyond. This is a major contribution. Um, I know that you've bought many copies here and I hope Marissa will come back and sign and, and, and give her special personal touch to you. But read it with interest. It's an amazing collection of narratives, of insights, and it's an important part of contemporary history. We need to be reminded continuously about people's feelings and their perceptions and their commitments in their lives to what a, whether it's a period which we've called in the past troubles or whether it's a period which we look forward to of peacefulness. Um, I'm very, very privileged to have been associated with the project in a very small way and to give the support that the centre has. And I speak for the whole of my centre in warmly congratulating Marissa for this amazing piece of work.
So I think um, we've been very fortunate also tonight to have found uh, Marissa's PhD supervisor, who's probably responsible for all her talent, to come and say a few words. Lord Paul Bew, who's known to all of you, I know. Um, thank you very much for joining Thanks, us Mike. tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mike. Um, I'm not responsible for all her talent, but, uh, but it was a pleasure to, to, to work with Marissa. Uh, I want to first of all thank, I think I have to say, and I think probably everybody understands what a great job uh, Mike Hardy is down in, in Coventry and the great role that the centre plays and the fact is provide a backdrop for Marissa's work which I don't think has been provided anywhere else and support for her which I don't think has been provided ever, everywhere else. I think we owe him a great debt, uh, uh, um, uh, a really great debt uh, uh, in terms of the help and the support that Marissa has actually had. Now I want to talk in two sections really. The first about the book uh, um, and, and then in a, in a minute about Marissa uh, and her struggle, and I think it is accurately described, the struggle is a bit of an overused word these days, but it is ac an accurate description of Marissa's, uh, Marissa's way of life, how to, the, how to brought this book about, uh, and, and, and indeed her next book, which will be coming soon, and how she's built such a fine career. Um, but I want to just begin by saying a few words. But first of all, the texture of research is terrific. As my friend Henry McDonald says, over 100 interviews, and I'm not sure anybody ever again is going to, well, it's just not repeatable, that kind of level of in-depth discussion in a certain political community, uh, um, which, uh, um, yeah, it is a certain community. I was just, sorry, coming, when I used the word community, there's an argument currently about in, in the literary papers in London about where the word community is ever used pejoratively. In other words, it's always talking about this, and you always imply they're, they're not being disturbed or whatever. I'm not, uh, you know, and the implication is always community, good thing, and so on. Uh, and if they're upset about something, we all ought to be upset, you know, the Muslim community or whatever, the Jewish community or whatever. Um, I'm not convinced, anyway, the consensus in the literary papers is nobody ever has in modern times used the word community pejoratively. Uh, I did scratch my head because and I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but some of you in the, in, in the room are old enough to remember the Secretary of State, Peter Brook, and the peace process and no selfish strategic interest. And in, and in that <coughs> speech, he talked about the terrorist community. And I don't know you know whether he actually meant anything pejorative in referring to the, but he, the whole thing was about how we deal with or talk to or whatever with the terrorist community. This was three or four years before the ceasefire. I don't think it was necessarily pejorative, but it's so, I don't think it was necessarily negative either. At least to put it this way, it's one, when I was reading all these arguments about the word community, uh, which are going on in the London literary magazines, it did occur to me that that example should have been discussed. Somebody could explain to me could you call it pejorative or not? Anyway, it is a book. The interviews are within a certain community, and in this case, the distant Republican community. And in that, in this case, I'm not using the word pejorative. That's a political tradition which exists uh, on this island, uh, and um, uh, I'm not using the word with any, uh, any in any way pejoratively at all. Uh, um, but uh, having, uh, so Ed Marissa's research is absolutely magnificent in this respect. And whether or not you have any particular sympathy for the position of distant Republicans and intellectual backdrop, it really doesn't matter. You probably guess I don't have a, absolutely a fantastic amount of sympathy or support. Uh, um, but you have to understand it. You have to respect the people who hold it and why they held this view. And this is the in-depth uh, 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 analysis. There's nothing better. And at this moment, for obvious reasons, it's very important indeed to pay attention uh, uh, to the sort of material and arguments and views which are listed in, in Marissa's book and the story of these struggles. Now, the book begins with an interview with a uh, um, quote from Kevin Hanna, and there's a slight bit of bad language in it. So I hope you'll forgive me because I do want to read the quote as it stands, right? Now, I think everybody in the room, as I look around, knows that the Hannah May Adams connection. I can remember Paddy Devlin talking to me about it in 1971 when I was asking who these people were. Uh, and everybody, by the way, it's another odd thing about House of Lords. <coughs> you get all these very prickly families who believe they're the real thing in the history of England. 
they're nothing to the West Belfast families, the prices are anyways. You got a lot of very prickly families who believe they're the real thing. They did the real thing for the and, and, and you know, sometimes I'm listening to these old boys and the eyes of lords. I think where have I heard that kind of thing before? And the answer is actually in West Belfast. Um, you know, very, very, you know, sure my family and I we were there and we did this and them on their late comers and they weren't really there and uh, you know, and so on. So um Kevin Hannaway, in fact, Marissa told me once, got very, gets very annoyed when people says, say to him, you're Jerry Adams' cousin. And he says, no, no, Jerry Adams is my cousin, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is Kevin Hannaway, one of the, uh, from one of the great Republican families of West Belfast. And this is the quote that opens the book. The present leadership of Sinn Féin, if they were out for an Irish Republic, they failed. If they were out for civil rights, they got it in 1973. So what the fucking hell was the other 30 years of war for? And that's worth the price of admission alone. And, and that's the question, of course, that everybody interviewed is trying to answer and try to, um, uh, and, and try to explain. And of course, a number of people that many people in the room will know, my student, Anthony McIntyre in particular, others there. I've said in a review in the TLS today, actually just out today, about the new book about Dolores Price that I used to know back in the civil rights movement. Uh, and I was a burnt toilet with her. Uh, the, uh, you know, that it, it became like a rat in the skull for them after the thing failed because, especially when Mr. Adams said he hadn't been part of the IRA, they felt they had to bear all the moral burden of what had happened uh, um, while he floated off I I into, into celebrity status. And it, it, that's why for so many of those people and so many of those who became involved in distant Republican, it, it is an almost unbearable burden. And it's something, I just speak as somebody entirely outside this world, I can actually respect how they feel about that and completely understand uh, the emotions that they have about that. So the book is very important. Uh, the, the tradition, Irish Republican tradition, is enormously important on this island, and the distant Republicans are there now called. And of course, she's quite right in inverted commas, to have it in inverted commas. Uh, uh, Marissa's quite right at the beginning of her book. I'm perfectly well aware of the argument that you make a case that it's not distant republicanism, it's actually mainstream of the real republicanism or whatever. Uh, um, but it, it is a very important book. The quality of the research is excellent. I don't actually quite know for sure what Marissa uh, actually thinks about all this. I know what she thinks about what you should know about the information you should have, the, the research you should have, but I actually don't quite know when, I, when Marissa the first project she did for me when I was supervisor was actually on the SDLP, uh, uh, and um, and I think her next book's going to be on the SDLP as well. Uh, and I don't quite know what she thought about the SDLP either. So I mean, you know, and that's a good sign, I think, in terms of 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 of, of, of the researcher. Uh, um, but I do want to say, having commended the book from the bottom of my heart, just say a little bit of a word about Marissa. It's not been easy. Since Marissa started to work in Coventry, things have been a lot better. But to do that with thesis, for example, uh, I, I can remember seeing you working in Primark, Tesco, Tesco at the Prime, just down in that, in, the, in that building, the old bank buildings, that one. And I used to see you working there to get money for you to get out for your research. And Marissa's family, and your grandma particularly, uh, uh, well, not particularly, but I know you're fond, you are of your grandma, your mother, your whole family really, really supported you. And it cannot have, and in those days, in the end, you lucked out with a, a very good man that you've seen tonight. But I honestly can't, um, well, I just know it was very difficult. That's the first thing to say. It's a real struggle to keep in academic life, get the PhD done, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it's never actually all that easy, even in comfortable circumstances, to do a good PhD. But to do it in these circumstances, that's a huge achievement. And I really uh, commend uh, uh, Mar uh, uh, for that, and I, I do think you have got to show. Uh, um, well, it's an example of showing resolve in difficult circumstances, and sometimes people show resolve in difficult circumstances. It doesn't work out. This book and the next book shows it has worked out for her. So I'm really, I'm really, really pleased about that because there's nobody. Uh, actually, people are saying to me today, well, she was your graduate student. Actually, I knew Marissa when she was an undergraduate. And I met her basically at the end of her second year in Queens, and I've known her ever since then. And I just so wonderful that she's now produced this book. Um, just you know, I, we belong to that we share something. Can we belong to a despised group? 
um, which is has to ride in the back. Human, people talk disdainfully about us. They don't think they have to display good manners in front of us. They display contempt to us, don't they, Marissa? And you and your grandmother and I were all a particular group of people. Who, lots of people think they were right, just a bad mouth. Uh, um, uh, this group is Manchester United supporters. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it is quite interesting. A lot of people, do, uh, my one moment of solidarity with Martin McGuinness was on this point when he was speaking in Glen Torrens uh, uh, shortly before he became ill. Actually, he spoke brilliantly that night about football and the DUP there. It was in Glen Torrens Football Club uh, director's room uh, and Glen Torrens had put on this event and uh, the executive was still running. The DUP minister, Simon Hamilton, spoke. Simon Hamilton said, Martin, you spoke really well about football. I really thought for a minute that you knew something about it until I realised, which Martin actually does know quite a lot about football, or he did know quite a lot about football. And, uh, but, you know, you know, but, but then at the end, you say, you're a Manchester United fan, and I realise you obviously don't know anything about it. <laughs> so I, Martin and I had this moment of solidarity. People on the back of the bus, always humiliated, always second-class citizens. People just feel they can say what they like to us. And I hugged him. You know, and, and you know, just uh, in solidarity of the humiliated, the people never shown what Seamus Malin always used to call for courtesy. Uh, no courtesy to us. Isn't that the experience we have? It's terrible, all these abuse. <laughs> and you're, and you're, you're <laughs> especially when we, we once wished to win trophies. Now we don't. But even now we get patronised. But that's even worse, as you know, that, ter that kind of liberal attitude of patronising you. It's even more humiliating, isn't it? Uh, you know, that's what Seamus should say, humiliation. And that's what those of us, and I see another one of the victims there and this, this humiliated community, Stephen, there is another Manchester United fan. Uh, um, that's what we, you know, oh, humiliation that we have gone through. And, and, and you, I, one of the great moments in Marissa's first time, the grandmother finally made it to Old Trafford. Uh, and was treated very well by the club and its grandees after the, how many years of loyal support did you give that club? 90th birthday. 90th birthday, so that's about 75 years of loyal support mm -hmm. that she'd given it. And I remember we talked quite a lot about that. So we, you can see we actually do share quite a lot, uh, Marissa and I. But actually, the most important thing we probably share, for, to be serious for a minute, is the, in a support and passionate interest in scholarly work. Uh, and in scholarly work in Irish history and politics. And it doesn't matter where somebody is coming from uh, uh, or what their broader political views are. What matters is they do the work professionally, that they write well. And this book is a tremendous achievement in that respect. Congratulations, Marissa. Thank you. I almost hesitate to think what Marissa's going to say about uh, our support. Um, when, when Marissa came and applied to be a research fellow at Coventry, the, there were two sets, as I mentioned before, of risk takers here. But I remember the question I asked, and maybe later we'll have a chance to, to have questions. And I asked, why do you want to do this particular piece of research? Um, and Lord Bure and Paul, you've, you've asked that same question in a sense. And it was her answer to that which was compelling. And it wasn't about campaigning, it wasn't about um, taking sides, it, wasn't, it was about scholarship and about the power of evidence and how evidence and, and the reporting, the accurate reporting of feelings and of robust research was going to help the troubled world that we've got. And that was totally convincing and she's delivered. Marissa. Thanks so much, Mike, and um, thanks very much, Paul. Um, and thanks to everyone who's come tonight. Um, I'm really overwhelmed by um, all the family and friends and supporters and well-wishers that have come along tonight. It's really special to me that you're all here. So thank you, and people who have encouraged me all over the years. Um, I also see many of the interviewees here tonight. And um, thank you so much for coming along, because without you, there would be no book. Um, I couldn't have done it. Um, and I'd like to give special thanks to Paul Bew uh, for launching this for me. Um, the last couple of weeks has been a bit of a whirlwind in terms of media coverage. Um, lots of journalists have been in touch since the bomb went off in Derry outside the courthouse. And uh, many of the journalists, almost all of them, who contacted me said, um, how come Lord Bew is launching this book on republicanism? And they were quite curious about that. So 
Um, but in actual fact, I can't think of anybody more suited to launch this for me than Paul Bew, because um, to explain how this came about, I need to take you back a bit. Um, I turned 35 on Tuesday. I wouldn't have mentioned it, except all the press did, so <laughs> the secret's out. So I can mention it, um, there's no hiding it. So I'm 35 now, but it was whenever I was about 19 um, and I first went into Queen's University uh, for my undergraduate that I met Paul as one of my lecturers. Um, and I realized he was a very special person and scholar. Um, and then in 2006, when I began my PhD, I was really privileged to have Paul as my supervisor. And Paul has been a great mentor, a great support, um, and we've had great fun, and he does some great impressions of Jerry Adams and other people, <laughs> which was always great fun to listen to around the office. Um, we have a lot of banter, um, and uh, he's been a wonderful mentor, and now I'm really happy to call him a colleague and a really great friend. So thank you, Paul, for launching this for me tonight. Um, I also owe a very special thanks to Mike Hardy, my boss, who's the director of our centre at Coventry, um, it's really appropriate that Mike's chairing this event because Mike really has, and the centre, have been a constant support throughout research, which has been really, really difficult. Um, in the first week that Mike hired me, I formally began this research project. I'm not sure Mike knew what he was letting himself in for. <laughs> no, it has been a bumpy ride. Um, it's been quite a journey, um, and as one... Mike once put it, Mike has been keeping me on the right side of the ethics committee for the last five years. Um, it's been a really difficult research project. Um, it's been a really personal journey, uh, many highs, many lows. Um, and at times it's gained the attention of the security services. Um, I think they were curious as to who this person was going in and out of every Republican house in Ireland. Um, I've been stopped and searched during the research, that was an experience, um, but some of the interviewees, um, I think they may be here tonight, said don't worry, um, when you're eventually put in McGabry, we'll claim you on the landing, so you'll be alright. Um, so, but on a serious note, um, it did get tense for a while, and I'm not sure how many bosses would have been so supportive and understanding throughout a really difficult period. I remember once phoning Mike to say to him that um, I had a bit of a problem, that I had received a phone call from the, a police man in the PSNI saying that if I didn't present myself to the barracks, I was liable to arrest. Um, I'd never been in a barracks in my life, and I asked what for, and he said for partaking in an illegal parade in Lurgan. Um, so I phoned Mike, <laughs> and I told him what had happened, and the ever calm and cool Mike just said to stay calm, to get a solicitor, and it would all be fine. Um, and I did have to laugh. The next time I saw Mike after that was at the Ulster Museum, and Mike was speaking, and there were other politicians and people, NGOs, community workers there. And when I walked into the room, Mike will remember this, um, he rather loudly got a bit excited when I walked in and said, have they dropped the charges against you yet? <laughs> to which a lot of surprised politicians and academics so I thought, oh God, who's this? But um, I understood you were, you were anxious that, um, that I was okay, and I thank you for that. Um, but I do thank Mike, a wonderful boss, a wonderful support, and a wonderful friend. Um, and I thank the centre for the constant support they've given this research through very turbulent waters. Um, and for also, you always believed in the contribution that this would make to knowledge and to understanding. Um, when I did go to the barracks with my solicitor to finish that story off, um, I was interviewed. It was my first time ever being under a police interview. Um, you answer five questions, yes or no, and then the solicitor did all the rest of the talking. I'm not, he may be here tonight, I'm not sure. Um, but they put in three tapes to record you, and the policewoman then said to me, pick one of the tapes. So I picked one of them and went to drop it in my bag, and this bewilder bewildered policewoman said, she laughed and she says, this is your first time in a barracks, isn't it? This, that's to go to the judge if, when the case goes to court. Um, so of course I was rather red faced and realized it wasn't a souvenir from the interview that um, they actually, the policewoman took it. So I never heard any more about that incident. Um, I think they realized I was an academic there conducting academic research, but I've attended Republican commemorations all throughout Ireland um, for this research and I took photos at many, some of which are in the book 
and in fact the cover of the book uh, is a picture I took on O'Connell Street in Dublin um, at a Republican Sinn Féin commemoration <coughs> in 2016. Um, but I've told some of these stories just to highlight the really bumpy journey that it's been over the last few years. Um, and I've often been asked, as, as Mike and Paul have both mentioned, what motivated me to write this book. Um, as Paul said, I grew up in the political hotbed of West Belfast. Um, I've always had a keen interest in politics. Um, and my granny, who um, Paul spoke about, personally knew Tom Williams um, when she lived in Clonard. Um, and also my mum, who's here tonight, would remember various incidents um, that took place throughout our lives that had an impact on me. Um, one of them was when I was 13. We were travelling from um, visiting family in Dublin, who are here this evening, and uh, we were travelling home to Belfast, and we were driving up Daisy Hill Road in Newry, and uh, the bus was hijacked. Um, we were all taken off at gunpoint, and mum will remember this well. Um, uh, we got our cases out and then they blocked the road with the bus and blew it up in front of us. So I always thought it was at the time of the drum cree disturbances. I al always thought that um, we must have looked a strange sight, this bus driver with his little money box and a full busload of people walking down uh, Daisy Hill <coughs> in Newry. Um, but then in later years, in 2009, I attended uh, a public meeting which was run by mainstream Sinn Féin in Clonard Monastery. And the purpose of that meeting was for them to persuade people to accept the PSNI. So I went along and I sat at the back in the actual church of Clonard Monastery and I watched as um, high profile uh, Sinn Féin members stood on the actual altar of Clonard um, saying why, why people needed to um, accept the PSNI. Um, and it, it broke out into a bit of a confrontation as people at the back shouted things like, my son didn't die for this, or I didn't spend a life sentence in jail for this. And I became really, really interested um, in what has come to be termed dissident republicanism. It's a word I don't use, as Paul says. But um, I became very interested in former comrades who had turned so bitterly against one another. Um, when I was in RTE studios on Monday there in Dublin, um, in a live interview, the first question that Sean O'Rourke asked me was, why have you got dissident, in inverted commas? Um, well, one of the reasons that I would say that I don't use the word is because many of those involved, including um, many of the interviewees, were active in the Republican movement prior even to the formation of the Provisionals in 69. Um, and so I think that alone um, means that the word is unhelpful or, or not useful or inaccurate. Um, but when we look at what's termed dissident republicanism, it's used collectively to refer to those who are opposed to the mainstream Sinn Féin direction. Um, many of them are former members of Sinn Féin or of the provisional movement. Uh, it encompasses a wide spectrum of people. Um, including those who are spokespersons for current armed groups. Um, and I interviewed some of those sp spokespersons for this research. Um, it also includes people, some of which are here tonight, who interestingly stayed with the provisional movement throughout the ceasefires of the 1990s, only to depart at a latter period. And that's an interesting group to look at as well, why they would stay through ideological changes to then depart in more recent years. Um, I think Bernadette Sands McKevitt, a sister of Bobby Sands, uh, summed it up quite well when she famously said, Bobby didn't die to be an equal British citizen in the state of Northern Ireland. Um, or another interviewee, Tommy McCurney, um, he was interviewed for the book, and in the book he says um, that, you know, in Stormont they're bound by the prevailing winds of London and that they're at best tinkering with British rule. Um, and so I was interested in these former comrades who had turned against one another and I began to conduct serious scholarly research into this topic. So I travelled all around Ireland, I interviewed people um, various locations, Belfast, Dublin, Tralee, Galway, Mayo, um, County Kerry, just to name a few. I also went into Magabry Prison and interviewed some of the prisoners in there. Um, that was my first time in a prison. Uh, many people don't realise that there's still current Republican prisoners in Ireland today. There's approximately 48. Um, and when I went into the prison, I actually didn't go in formally. I went in um, on visits with the other families. Uh, so 
I got the full experience of what the families and visitors go through um, and with the drug dogs walking around you and the whole thing that you go through there and um, I want to thank not only the prisoners who let me conduct the interviews but also uh, their families who gave and partners who gave up their <coughs> visits for me to go in and interview them because it's quite remarkable given that they only have a certain number of visits from their families and so I'd like to really thank them for that. Um, I'd also like to thank all the interviewees, um, a lot of them are here tonight and I'm delighted to see them. Um, I really could write a separate book on my experience of conducting the interviews through Ireland. Um, I, th I hope that this research is a really um, important collection of oral testimonies um, and some of the interviewees have actually died since given their interview. No relation to the interview, um, the way I said that. Uh, but, um, uh, and also we have, um, just to clear, we've had enough problems in this project to clear that up. Uh, also a few of them aren't here tonight. Um, Kevin Hannaway is currently being imprisoned. Um, uh, and so I want to thank them and I hope I've done the job I set out to do in really delving into the psyche of what has been termed dissident republicans um, or what I would call radical or revolutionary republicanism. Um, I've hoped I've brought out the voices of the individuals who are quoted throughout the book. Um, and I began this research in the aftermath of the Boston College project. And I think it's important to mention it. It's like the elephant in the room. And many people said to me that they didn't think I'd be able to do this research in the post-Boston context um, and that I mightn't get any interviewees. But actually, I found um, interviewees incredibly willing to participate. And in fact, I had to draw a line at 90 because I could have kept going. Um, and when I started this, I went down to Drogheda and I met with Anthony McIntyre, a former student of Paul's and the Boston College researcher, who isn't here tonight because there's an arrest warrant out for him. He can't um, enter the North or England, so he will be at the Dublin book launch next week. But um, Anthony was the researcher, and I said to him in a nice way, what went wrong and how do I avoid it? Um, how do we not make the same mistakes? And Anthony said, it's very simple. Don't ever let anyone incriminate themselves under any circumstances. Um, and so as the interviewees will attest to, I started every interview by, by giving that, um, please don't. Uh, and so there's nothing illegal in the tapes. And I think that's maybe why um, the project was so successful and, and, and a lot of trust was built. Um, as well as, as the interviewees, I also thought it was important to give the opposing argument. Um, Sinn Féin were unavailable for, as in mainstream Sinn Féin, were unavailable for interviews for this. Um, and so I interviewed Danny Morrison, the former director of publicity uh, for Sinn Féin. And um, I spent several days, uh, each day several hours, interviewing Danny. Um, and obviously he was the spokesperson then for the counterweight mainstream argument and when I was leaving his house in West Belfast I said thanks so much Danny you know for the interview and I'll never forget it he took me by the arm and he said that wasn't an interview that was an interrogation um, so I'm quite proud of that because I think I did my job um, and it's fine I bumped into him yesterday so it's it's all right but um, I did I spent over five years researching this and um, in order to produce a serious assessment of radical republicanism and I hope it will contribute to our understanding I wanted to move beyond the simple stereotype that's often betrayed in the mainstream and to get to the heart of radical republicanism um, in recent days we've seen the media trying to link Brexit to what happened in Derry last Saturday the bomb that went off and so I thought it would be remiss not to mention Brexit um, because Republican, Republican activity isn't related to Brexit nor is it a response to it um, but rather some would see Brexit to, as an opportunity to be exploited um, but radical Republicans are articulating the traditional Republican position and ideology. You know, I often say to people, if you stood at gravesides throughout Ireland today at Republican commemorations, you would hear exactly the same Republican message that you would have heard in the 70s and 80s. And um, the message is simple: it's about achieving a 32-county socialist republic. Um, I hope that this book will contribute to our understanding and I also thank Manchester University Press who along with Mike received a few difficult calls along the way about um, things that were happening and unfolding. Um, I'd like to finish by thanking a very special person, my mum, who's here tonight. 
um, she has been a massive support. Um, she's been at my side through highs and some very bad lows in this. Um, over the past week, almost every journalist has asked me, are you any relation to Dominic? It's the first question everywhere we go. Um, and I gave the honest answer of no, but when my mum was at school, she pretended he was her uncle and there was no bullying there. Um, so apart from being quite a funny person, she's a wonderful person and she really has helped me through this and she's been there every step of the way. And so once again, I just want to thank absolutely everyone who came tonight. I really, really appreciate it. I really do. And I hope you enjoy the book and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. So thank you. <laughs>